Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Australian Bitcoin podcast. On this episode, we've got a news podcast to talk about the latest news in Bitcoin for October. And joining me, we've got Alex. So Alex just joined joined me at Hardblock. He's working, he'll be working kind of as a product manager, helping improve the Hardblock platform. But he also does a lot of other things helping me with content and support. So he's been a great help. Alex, how have you found the work so far? Yeah, hi, Dan. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to join Hardblock. It's been a good way to sort of dig into a new side of Bitcoin that I haven't seen so far. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to discussing the news. And so we, we met at the Bitcoin Bush Bash. That's one of the kind of local Bitcoin events. Maybe just briefly, like, yeah, why are you, are you interested in Bitcoin? Why am I interested in Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in Bitcoin. I came to Bitcoin from the Austrian economics lens. So I've sort of always grown up aware of Austrian economics. And it was something like I was, I'd say, quite well aware of the problems in money. And I just happened to stumble across, a, I guess, a Robert Breedlove video where he articulated that concept and linked it to Bitcoin. Bitcoin was something that I sort of was aware of previously, but I'd stayed away. I sort of, I guess, maybe viewed it as a Ponzi scheme or whatever, like a lot of people. Or it was only when those two concepts got linked that I, I got very interested very quickly, like a lot of people do. So if you need to help with Bitcoin or hard block or anything, if you go to support Alex, we'll be there to help you out. Yeah, so we just got back last week from the Indonesian Bitcoin conference. I enjoyed myself. Uh, how did you find the conference, Alex? Do you think it was worth it? What was the like key takeaways for, for you? Yeah, I thought it was a great conference. The facilities in Bali, obviously, they're available for putting on conferences are fantastic. It's into Southeast Asia, right, as opposed to Australia. So it's a lot it's a lot easier travel burden for people to come from all over. So I met Bitcoiners from Vietnam and Thailand and uh, obviously a lot of like, international speakers. So that's, I guess that's the real highlight as well. It's like the diversity of Bitcoiners that have came to the event. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Same for me. I think Bitcoiners tend to be pretty interesting people. So, and the ones who come to these kind of conferences, just on the last day, we were talking to this guy from in Chiang Mai. He's like helping. He, he has a local business. He has a business in the US, which supports him. So he spends most of his time like educating the local villages in Chiang Mai, in Thailand about Bitcoin. And he helped like set up solar panels for them where they can use Bitcoin in these kind of like rural remote villages. So that was like one example, but there were many other ones, uh, like just interesting people doing interesting things. So it's always great to talk to these people. And yeah, and in terms of the presentations, the presentations were all right, to be honest. There were some which I liked, most of them, at least for myself, I thought I knew like I had a lot of that stuff before, but yeah, it was just meeting people. Like there were a lot of interesting people. It was great to hang out and it was kind of like a very relaxed atmosphere at lunch and then there's the after parties and having drinks and talking to people about Bitcoin. So I really enjoyed myself. Uh, unfortunately, we got sick, a little bit sick in the last two days, but I guess that's the price you pay for having fun. Yeah, still recovering, but uh, definitely worth it. Okay, so we'll get on to the news. Uh, Probably the most important news, I think, for us, at least in Australia, is there was some regulation in Australia. Really, well, okay, so the government released a consultation paper of proposed regulations for the digital currency industry in Australia. So that was released, I think, two weeks ago now with the regulation. Okay, so there's going to be a three month consultation period, and then there'll be a one-year period for the industry to comply. So it's still in the consultation phase, so it might change. Overall, I've had people in the discussions with people in the Bitcoin industry, and we find most of them are not very happy with it. They think it's very going to be very hard for us to comply. I guess probably the biggest obstacle is we will require an IF, we will be required to have an IFSL license, which is okay. That's kind of expensive, but okay. But I think also part of the IFSL license is we're gonna need to get insured insurance, and that's gonna be very hard to find insurers who be willing to insure us. And if we do find that, that'd be very expensive. So yeah, with the regulations, the insurance is going to be hard for us to get. It's gonna be somewhat expensive and it's going to be high, find, hard to find an insurer that's uh, going to insure us. But I, I'm sure we'll find a solution. We've, in the industry body, we're talking about different options 
maybe combining together to get the license. It's wise to get around it because most of the requirements by the new regulation is about custody. So we have an option of making hard block fully non-custodial. That's something that we could also do. So I think there's some options for us and we'll see what we do and how we tackle the obstacle when we find out more about the actual regulation. But yeah, so yeah, apart from the re- requirement to have the IFSL license, uh, there's some other requirements which are not too bad, um, like there's some kind of solvic- solvency requirement and some minimum liquid assets that exchanges would need to have. There's there'd be a requirement to keep funds, as I understand, Bitcoin in a, some kind of trust, um, some kind of software and software audits and exchange audits. So a lot of the regulation right now, it's it's a bit vague. I found the, reading the regulation, some of it tends to be a bit vague. So it's hard to exactly, so that's probably not good because it's hard to interpret it. But yeah, but that's kind of like the summary. Alex, what do you think of regulation? What's your take on it? Yeah, well, maybe first off, so an AFSL is an Australian Financial Services yeah. Licence. In terms of the regulation, yeah, it really seems like one of the big pushes is to try and separate the idea of sort of an exchange service from a custody service. I think it kind of makes sense because if you look at where all of the problems have come from with crypto, it's when uh, they're rehypothecating their customer funds and then they blow up. Um, so I, I think I understand where it's coming from, but what we're really worried about, I guess, is putting up some kind of regulatory moat which prevents new entrants and allows the existing players to sort of come to monopolize the industry. Yeah, no, yeah, that's correct. So it seems that some of the big exchanges in Australia are pushing for this, and it's probably the likely reason they're doing it is they're trying to create a regulatory mode for themselves. And the goals of preventing, mm, protecting consumers and preventing hacks, you know, that's a good goal. I'm not sure if the regulation will really accomplish that. I mean, things like, and I know to say why, for example, customers getting scammed often the, the way we see people getting scammed is in Bitcoin or whatever. They go to these services which promise to give them like a yield and a return. And then these services go away. But I don't see how, for example, this regulation will prevent that. The way we do it right now, they go through the exchanges in Australia and then they go to these other services which promise them a return. So, And these services are just run by anonymous people, usually outside of Australia. So I, I don't see how the regulation is going to stop that. You know, even, even in an exchange, trust an exchange, that an exchange won't go under or something like that. To be honest, there's laws against that already. Like the Sam Bankman freed in the US, he's being charged because he lied about the financial, sti- financial state of FTX. And like there's laws against that already. Um, but if he, if people are even like, I guess the solution is already to, to charge people like that. And in Australia also, it was an exchange that went under uh, ICX about four years ago or something. But again, the people that like were being very charged, some of them ran away. So we don't know where they are, but a lot of that stuff is illegal also. And, you know, putting like Bitcoin in a trust, you know, if that's all very good, it sounds great. Okay. So the Bitcoin has to be in a trust. But what does that actually, it kind of, it's kind of irre- irrelevant for Bitcoin because, okay, it's in a trust, but if like a hacker or the owner runs away with it, what does that legal protection do? You can't yeah, exactly. stop Bitcoin. Yeah. Those kind of laws don't apply really. The politicians want to make rules, so let them make rules. So the other big thing that happened in October was there was um, reason, a bug discovered in Bitcoin Lightning. What do you know about that? I don't know all the details either. In our newsletter this month, we've linked, um, there's a great post trying to explain the attack by uh, Mononaut. Um, he sent up a really good graphical representation of that. So first thing, this is like a bug on Lightning. So it's not a Bitcoin, it's Lightning. Lightning is the layer two for routing small payments. Okay, the big takeaway is if you do run a Lightning node yourself, who some of our customers might, it affects people it could possibly affect you. It would only affect you if you actually, if your Lightning node is routing payments. So if you're just using it to receive and send, it won't affect you. But if yeah, if you are a routing node, 
pen, it could possibly affect you. And if so, if you do run a lightning node, you should probably upgrade that with some kind of mitigation. And you should upgrade your node if you do have one. In terms of consequences of this, it does seem to be something that's not that easily to actually exploit. So yeah, there's a lightning developer, I, I, I'll read his comment. And he said, this is a rather fragile attack, which requires paranoid setup extremely precise timing and execution, non-confirming superposition of all transactions and instant propagation across the entire network. So yeah, it's not a, it doesn't seem to be something that's very, very easy to exploit, but theoretically it can be exploited. And there have been some mitigations, but it seems having a kind of a proper fix for it is a bit hard. People not sure how to fix it. It seems like to get a proper fix we might actually need to make ch some changes to the Bitcoin bias layer to prevent this happening. So it could possibly, possibly even needing a soft fork or something like that. But yeah, like I think the takeaway is lightning; it's still working. And while we did find a bug, you know, it's not kind of the end of the world. Is that kind of your reading, your understanding of it, Alex? Also, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. It's there's a there's a number of these kinds of like very niche attacks on on lightning. It's almost inherent to the design of Lightning, like Lightning has a series of trade-offs. And actually, the more anonymous we try to make Lightning, the more, I guess, always attack surface there is, because it becomes a lot harder to figure out who's attacking you and how to defend against it. And that's why we also do this kind of layered approach. We have a Bitcoin base layer, and then we have more complex things like Lightning on layer two, as opposed to something like Ethereum, where we try to put everything on the base layer like separating it into like different layers is a much better design that's a much better design the way bitcoin does it because if you do have some kind of issues on voice in that kind of more complicated feature set on the second layer they don't actually affect how the bias layer works so you can kind of take more risky approach and do more experimental things and so it kind of shows the validity of that approach i believe of doing things with layers so anything else we think, like any other news, October, we think we should cover? I guess one of the fun news items for that came out right at the end of October, or indeed October 31st on Halloween, was, um, uh, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation probably, but Botev Plovdiv uh, FC, so Bulgaria's oldest football club, uh, adopted Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not sure if they've got a Bitcoin standard as such, but they uh, uh, as in, I'm not sure if they're converting all of their treasuries across to Bitcoin, maybe not straight away, but they're accepting Bitcoin payments and they're looking to to build Bitcoin into their operations over there, which I think is exciting as a football fan. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so that's good news because it looks like we put, possibly might uh, lose perf, uh, the Bitcoin perf. Yeah, the trailblazers. Yeah. yeah. Because for those who don't know, apparently the, the CEO who... Uh, kind of promoted Bitcoin for the Perf. Well, what's the name of the club again? Perf. Perf Heat. Perf Heat, yeah. yeah. Uh, apparently, he lost his position as the CEO. So it looks like um, possibly the, the new management might not continue that kind of Bitcoin path. Yeah. So, but that's right. We lose one club and we lose kind of another team. So, yeah, just unfortunately not in Australia, but yeah, that's right. Um, oh. Yeah, it's still exciting news. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I've got some other news. So in October or so, Trezor came out with a new model, a new hardware wallet, Trezor 3. From I had a quick look at it. To me, it seems the most important difference between the previous model is that they now come with a secure element. So a secure element is something that makes the hardware device more secure in the event where a hacker has actual physical access to the device. So that was kind of a criticism of Trezor there. The disadvantage of it is that the secure elements are usually closed source, and I believe this one is also a closed source. Yeah. Any comments? No, I don't, I don't have a lot to offer on this one. I know that... Um... I do wonder whether, sorry, whether Trezor's added the secure element um, because they've changed their minds. Because historically, they've been quite resistant to the idea of adding 
um, secure elements. In fact, I've sort of, I think that's, maybe I'm wrong here, but I, I think they've even criticized uh, adding secure elements because they're closed source and you're not necessarily aware of what they're doing. Um, but maybe it's just, they've just responded to market demand. Maybe the market demand for a secure element is just so strong that they've decided to put an option out there with a secure element. Yeah, that would be my guess because, well, I actually kind of understood their position. I, I know a lot of people thought, oh, you know, Trez, Trezor is not that secure because it doesn't have a secure element. So a lot of people had that kind of opinion. So yeah. I reckon that's it. Yeah, like that's yeah, they just, at least, I mean, at least they have both options now, so you can choose whichever you prefer. I thought some Australian-specific news that I guess really highlights the case for Bitcoin was... Um, at least I'm I'm obviously Sydney based, and so seeing the New South Wales is going turning to uh, raid the bank accounts of those who went through hotel quarantine, and then I guess try to avoid paying uh, for the hotel quarantine. So they've turned to the courts and got a whole bunch of garnishee orders, and now they're going straight into people's bank accounts and um, withdrawing. So it was good to see Chris Minns, who's the Premier of New South Wales, uh, basically saying sorry, but New South Wales needs the money um so yeah so it just really drives home that you know money in the bank is not your money they'll they'll come and take it if they want to sorry so i'm not sure if i understand so basically during the covid people were forced to qu quarantine in a hotel and the government at the time promised that they will pay the hotels for that quarantine uh, so, so the situation was people returning from overseas back to Australia had to quarantine for, in a hotel, and uh, they were forced, they were required to pay for the hotel. But the payment was uh, like you you didn't have to pay for it at the time. It was just a I'm not sure exactly, but it was a requirement to pay later down the track. And then obviously a lot of people haven't paid for that since. And uh, what we're seeing now is just the the New South Wales government, New South Wales government has basically decided to do some you know. What I would call cost recovery, uh, and they've gone straight to people's bank accounts with court orders to to seize those yeah, funds. Okay. Right. So they're basically like taking the funds. Well, yeah. I mean, if you have a, that's it shows you if you have your funds in Bitcoin, the government can do that. So um, just yeah. Ask. Well, they at least need to ask. They at least need to ask rather than just going straight to the courts and getting a court order. Right. I mean, yeah. With the current financial system, we can do whatever we want. Uh, they can just take the money if they have all the power. Like, yeah, in Bitcoin, they can give you a court. I guess they can threaten to send you to jail, but they can't really take it. If you are in, if you have it in self-custody, they can't take it unless you give them access to voice funds. It makes it much harder uh, to do. That's why, like, you know, people actually, on a related note, because people always, like, now say about CBDCs, and I'm kind of of opinion, it's actually like the fear about CBDCs. Well, it's well funded, but it's not because in, in a way we actually already have CBDCs and everything that we imagine can be done by the government right now. They can take money and do everything they want. So you don't really need a CBDC for that. Yep, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, this, this, I just think this, this little news item really highlighted that. Yeah, for a few I mean, people. if you, yeah, if you, that's right. Yeah. If you don't like CBDCs, but really the only solution is to promote and, uh, use bitcoin that's the only answer and um, yeah I, I don't have any avenues do you have any anything else you want to cover no i think uh oh maybe just maybe just the last one about self-managed super funds buying uh bitcoin there was a an interesting article in the australian financial review with um a friend uh, jeff Hugh was being interviewed and just basically pointing out that there's a potential problem down the track for uh a huge number of smsfs which are supposedly buying uh you know bitcoin and other cryptos but just leaving it on an exchange and that that actually is potentially in violation for how smsfs are, are meant to be run where you're meant to have uh direct control of the asset itself so i thought that was that's quite interesting worth a read um as always buying bitcoin keeping it in self custody for your smsf is the way to go mm, yeah right no okay. problems. Who, who who said that again uh jeff you uh, from monochrome Oh, okay, right. Oh, sorry. Oh, Jeff. Okay, sorry. I didn't. Okay, so yeah, I don't know that. So potentially holding um, self money super funds like the Bitcoin in it, holding it on exchange is not allowed. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. 
He said it's yeah. it's one of those areas that he expects clarification. That's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend holding yourself mining super fund Bitcoin on an exchange. Like by definition, like your super money, that's a long term investment. And if you're holding it on an exchange, who knows what's going to happen over 10 years, you know, even with a regulation like, OK, it's held in a trust, whatever. But if some exchange gets hacked, like I said, it just all these regulations mean nothing. OK, so I think we can probably finish for today. OK, cool. Do you yeah, have anything well, else? No, no, no that's, that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Good to talk with you, Alex. And um, yeah, stay tuned, everybody. And next in next month, we'll come back again to do these kind of monthly highlights. So yeah, give us some feedback if you liked it or if there's anything you'd want us to cover. And talk to you next time.